They who give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. The above remark, stated astutely by Dr. Benjamin Franklin, noticeably employs the language of liberty and safety, two perennial notions that are commonly considered to be polar opposites. It may help to envision the two on opposing ends of the scale, with liberty fixed on the left, shall we say, and safety or security on the right. The state of affairs with maximal liberty would see people completely in control. To quote the philosopher John Locke, it would entail man's freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit, within the bounds of the law of nature. The antithesis of this, a state of affairs with maximal security, would see people safer but very much not in control. This is because security demands restriction to human freedom. Through imposing laws and obligations, one is more protected against the unchecked spectrum of human action, but less free. Man is born free, says Rousseau, and everywhere he is in chains. And what he means by this, of course, is that to participate in even the most liberal of societies, it still requires you to surrender a little liberty. Suppose one agrees not to steal, for instance. This accord limits the individual's liberty to attain property. Namely, one cannot now take property already belonging to another. This kind of restriction is not necessarily a bad thing, of course. In fact, it's of near unanimous consensus that these social structures are critical for the development of our species. But outside of basic cooperation as societies naturally expand and grow, there is need to institute a stronger system to regulate human freedom. A system of government. Governments, by their very nature, are mechanisms of control. Indeed, to borrow the words of the great Thomas Paine, security is the true design and end of government. The end of government, or the enterprise of government, can thus be understood as a structure tilting our scale to the right, away from total liberty. On a foundational level, this may seem a reasonable adjustment to make, but one resounding question still presents itself. How much liberty ought an individual sacrifice for security? This very issue has inspired centuries of political philosophy and writings, from Hobbes' Leviathan to Hume's Treatise of Human Nature. One of the most important of these works was written in the mid-19th century by the English philosopher John Stuart Mill. Titled On Liberty, the text focuses on the nature and limits of the power that can be legitimately exercised by society over the individual. Mill begins by first outlining the necessity of government. To prevent the weaker members of the community from being preyed upon by innumerable vultures, he says, it was needful that there should be an animal of prey stronger than the rest commissioned to keep them down. This, he intimates, is the role of government, a regulatory body to protect its denizens from each other. However, he warns, the king of the vultures would be no less bent upon preying on the flock than any of the minor harpies. As government can then be equally predatory and harmful to its populace, liberty is the measure of defence taken against it. It is, quote, the protection against the tyranny of political rulers. Mill then proceeds to offer a quasi-anthropological account of the historic relation between liberty and authority. He describes how in smaller societies, rule under a single authority was unavoidable. This government was what Thomas Paine would probably categorise as a necessary evil, a system that did not govern by the will of the people, but rather served as a stabilising force. To protect against tyranny, the people gained political rights called civil liberties, and the ruler was obliged to respect these immunities. Mill adds that constitutional checks were also established to embolden the consent of the community in major decisions regarding them. However, he proceeds, eventually, a time came in the progress of human affairs, when men ceased to think it a necessity that their governor should be an independent power. The people learned to rule themselves and a democracy was instituted as a result. But, Mill speculates, a democratic system will inevitably lead to a tyranny of the majority. Alexis de Tocqueville shares this reservation, lamenting in his seminal work, in matters of government, the majority of a people has the right to do everything. This thought greatly troubled Mill, especially as the safeguards of civil liberty and constitutional checks would not counteract tyranny by prevailing feeling. Why is this a problem? Well, if a government were unchecked by constitution and trampled civil liberties through law, such as Orwell's fictional Big Brother society, the masses would eventually have good reason to resist. A majority, through sheer numbers alone, is always capable of displacing a minority rule. 
so even dictatorships and oligarchies must be careful, because their tenure of power still rests at least at part on the majority implicitly accepting their governance. But this is not the case for rule by the mob, or ochlocracy. If the majority are the ones yielding the power, then they have no or little reason to respect the civil liberties of the minority. 51 people may then rob the 49 of their rights. Society, Mill observes, is already guilty of an imposition of values, but here the power of public opinion might compromise individual liberty more than law. Perhaps Nietzsche had been right to say that the mob is the most ruthless of tyrants. Mill identifies this as a problem that has been broadly neglected by his contemporaries. Although thinkers and societies in general sometimes question the imposition of values from public opinion, they usually do so out of disagreement with the values being imposed, rather than disagreeing with the imposition itself. This would not be as considerable a problem if public opinion was dictated by reason. However, he worries that public opinion is usually dictated instead by preference and that the majority are complacent in resourcing reasons for their beliefs. This means that public opinion may not even necessarily be correct, just loud. This echoes the concerns of the philosopher Edmund Burke. In his essay, Reflections on the Revolution in France, he expresses his reservations against revolutionary action. Government of the majority, he argues, is a feeble system of rule, and nothing turns out to be so oppressive and unjust as a feeble government. Mill is perhaps more sympathetic to the Enlightenment project than Burke, but certainly shares this sentiment. He recognises the challenge as such. There is a limit to the legitimate interference of collective opinion with individual independence, and to find that limit and maintain it against encroachment is as indispensable to a good condition of human affairs as protection against political despotism. He then sets out to answer the practical question of where to set the limit, expresses it, expressing his answer forthwith. The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilised community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. Over himself, over his body and mind, the individual is sovereign. Succinctly, one should be free in their actions so long as they do not harm others or restrict the freedom of others. This is what is known as the harm principle. Interestingly, this notion sits in agreement with the French document The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. Penned in 1789 by Emmanuel Joseph Sayers, the Marquis de Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson, it states, liberty consists in the freedom to do everything which injures no one else. So why should we follow Mill's harm principle, you may ask? Well, he replies, because it's useful to. He grounds its basis in the idea of utility, meaning he believes that following it would best promote the general well-being of the people. By following this rule, those within society who harm others can now be punished, legally or socially, on a reasonable basis. Furthermore, he adds, there are also many positive acts for the benefit of others which he may rightfully be compelled to perform, such as to give evidence in a court of justice, simply because in failing to do so one plausibly causes some harm. Freedom, at its very foundation, is the pursuit of one's own good without causing harm to others. Reflecting this, Mill outlines what he regards as the three fundamental civil liberties. First, and most important, is liberty of conscience, liberty of thought and feeling, absolute freedom of opinion and sentiment on all subjects, practical or speculative, scientific, moral or theological, the liberty of publishing and expressing opinions. These liberties are broadly encompassed by the description freedom of expression or freedom of speech, and even today Mill remains one of their most ardent defenders. The second fundamental liberty is the liberty to pursue one's tastes, regardless of whether others find the conduct foolish, perverse or wrong, so long as it doesn't harm or impede our fellow man, naturally. It would not be wrong to consider this a defence of homosexuality, and Mill could reasonably be interpreted as advocating LGBT rights in general as a crucial civil liberty. The third, Mill proceeds, is the liberty, within the same limits, of combination among individuals, freedom to unite. The three liberties, for him, are indispensable. He holds, no society in which they are not, on the whole, respected can be free, whatever may be its form of government and none is completely free, in which they do not exist absolute and unqualified. It follows that even a democratic society is not truly free unless it earnestly upholds these liberties, and even if the masses demand their contravention, it is important to protect them above all else. In saying this, Mill disagrees with society's tendency to favour security over liberty on our scale. In this regard, he allies himself with the thought of Thomas Jefferson. 
who once stated he would rather be exposed to the inconveniences attending too much liberty than to those attending too small a degree of it. Unfortunately, that is the end of the video. Hopefully you now have a clearer understanding of Mill's general position and the historic context against which he makes it. If you're interested in a video, by the way, like this for the rest of the text, please leave a comment saying so below. And as always, if you've enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. And if you haven't already subscribed, it's a great way to support the channel and ensure that we can make more content like this. Also, be sure to turn on notifications so you'll know whenever we upload a new video. Thank you for watching.